Sam Cedar, Emma Vigland on the Majority Report. It's a pleasure to welcome back to the program Mark Bankston. He is a partner at the law firm of Farrar and Ball. And uh, Mark, I appreciate you taking the time to talk to us. You you seem like you're extremely busy this week. Yeah. Yeah, I've had a pretty busy week this week. That's for sure. (laughs) All right. Now, I know you can't really uh, talk too much about this, but just uh, broadly, what has been reported at the very least? Or what can you just, just tell us about this case involving Elon Musk? Well, I can tell you that, uh, you know, the court ordered discovery in that case. Uh, We ended up taking his deposition, as a lot of people have seen. Um, Mm -hmm. There is some pending sanctions uh, in that case. And we're also going to have a hearing on the motion to dismiss on April 22nd. And what Uh, is the case about? Like, what is your uh, your client um, uh, 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 claiming? This one is strange. It really is. Do Do you even think of the idea that one of the richest and most influential people on the planet accused a 22-year-old Jewish college student of being a neo-Nazi involved in a neo-Nazi brawl in Portland, Oregon, uh, which is completely absurd and was based on some very dubious tweets from some anonymous weirdos on Twitter. And Mr. Must decided to spread that to the world. And Ben Brody's not going to let that happen. Uh, great. And I appreciate your, your catching us up with that. You know, at one point he may, it's the, the I don't know if the word is irony, but it is fascinating to watch this guy who bought Twitter essentially um, uh, uh, made it possible to almost make it impossible to use Twitter as a source to validate things. Keeps getting tripped up by essentially what he wrought on himself That's true. Uh, by by making Twitter a, a, a much less reliable source of information. Uh, that he spreads, I, I find somewhat fascinating. But you, you've got a lot of stuff on your plate in terms of like false information. You, uh, I mentioned uh, before you came on that you are um, uh, representing a plaintiff, Mauricio Garcia, uh, in a case. Tell us about that case. Sure. Um, most of y'all remember last year, during last summer, there was a neo-Nazi shooter down in Allen, Texas, at the outlet malls. Um, killed quite a few people down there. Uh, it was a really, really nasty event. In the aftermath of that, the um, the law enforcement released the name of the shooter and his date of birth. Uh, but several media organizations, sort of in their their haste to try to get a story out, uh, it labeled the wrong person, not even the right birth date um, of my client, Mauricio Garcia, put his face out to the world. And for a lot of these organizations, it was because my client has a very Chicano appearance. He, he is a Dallas lowrider. And he does not look like the kind of Mexican-American who would sympathize with white supremacy. And so a lot of these right-wing organizations wanted to put his face out there to say, hey, look at this Mexican guy. He's not a Nazi. Look at this guy. And as a result, I mean, you know, millions of people saw my client as a monster. And this was done by a big variety of news organizations, including Fox News, Newsmax, Tim Pool, Stephen Crowder, Owen Schroyer, Hollywood Unlocked, Simon Ataba, and Today News Africa. I mean, we have a large group of defendants who all basically, you know, ignored basic journalistic precautions. And as a result, this this poor young man, you know, his mom was getting calls from people they've known all their lives saying, hey, I'm so sorry about your son. I'm so sorry your son is a neo-Nazi killer. Oh my and, God. you know, his mom could correct some of those when they'd call. But that family's just sitting there thinking about all the people in their lives who, who have known them throughout their lives who aren't going to call, who will be too embarrassed to ever call. And, and, you know, it has torn this poor kid up. He just feels so guilty about what it's done to the family. And do, do you know where he, uh, the conflation of your client with the actual neo-Nazi shooter uh, originated from? What, like, it was on social media, and, and it looks to be on Twitter is, okay. is where it first started. Gotcha. And then, you know, it was it was originally just social media people getting it wrong, right, having the wrong identity. And then it was these commercial media organizations who are expected to have institutional guardrails against this sort of stuff. I mean, photo verification is not a challenging thing to do as a journalist. If you can't confirm the provenance of a picture and know what it is and where it came from, you just can't put that out to the world, especially if you're going to try to say it depicts a neo-Nazi mass murderer. And so really, you know, there's not much we can do about just random people on social media, but these commercial enterprises that are profiting from the provision of news, they have to use reasonable care. And what we've seen is that the bigger organizations, like in this case, Fox and, and Univision, they, they've just done away with their institutional guardrails because it's just costing them too much money. 
And then you have these new, you know, people like Crowder and Poole who are running these low cost operations who've never cared about the institutional guardrails to begin with. So the entire media apparatus is failing from top to bottom. This isn't a problem that's just isolated to one kind of media. Uh, I, it, it, it makes me think of Spotify and uh, some of the uh, sort of um, um, uh, lies that come out of, uh, of um, uh, Rogan's show. Um, he's smart enough not to uh, maybe have these lies focused on one person enough so that somebody could bring an action. It's sort of just like, you know, who has standing in these issues uh, in terms of like Spotify having to take responsibility for these things. But the thing that really stuck out for me um, in reading your, uh, um, the, uh, the plaintiff's petition is in each of these instances, it seems. Um, and I think I read all, all of the, the defendants, the, outlet i mean because we we get stuff wrong here uh, we're we're very cautious about putting pictures out i don't know if we ever do that really frankly but um but we get stuff wrong a, a variety of things i mean it, but we're, we're really careful with identities i have to say uh but be that as it may people make mistakes but in each of these instances it seems like there was an opportunity for these outlets to correct themselves and they didn't. Yeah. And they didn't, oh. or, or or to the extent that they even did any effort, they never did a retraction. Right. Right. Most that of them just really strikes me as like, like almost like doubly bad. It is. It is. And in and in Texas, it's bizarre because if they had just apologized and issued a retraction, they wouldn't face punitive damages. But they all made the decision in this case not to apologize for certain broadcasts. And, you know, in some of those, it makes sense. Some of them, you know, are just not going to respond to you. Some of them did. And we had discussions and they deleted the articles quietly, but didn't print retractions. Or you have in the case of Univision, who when we went to them, they originally just told us, oh, we just did it on our streaming service. And, you know, nobody really watches that. And then we found out, no, the whole time they had been broadcasting it to millions of people on their primetime shows and didn't print a retraction for any of that. You know, it, it really is strange. And and what was really strange is that most of these defendants were represented by counsel when we were talking to them. The only one that wasn't was Tim Poole, who thought that he could negotiate with me without an attorney. Oh, well, my and gosh. And he didn't get a retraction either. Well, um, I want to hear I want to hear about <laughs> Tim Poole, Mark. But I mean, Tim is also very specific. Like his his issue here is that the actual shooter and this is what I went in, in when I went there and I, I was talking to him about it. This is what got him very upset. I pointed out that he had called it a psyop, um, a psychological operation, because the actual shooter had been posting about his show. Right. And so there's also a self-interest here in misidentifying the person, uh, your client, as the shooter versus the neo-Nazi shooter who had been who had posted That's about Tim's show before. Absolutely. Well, you know, it's like I, I had pled in, in the Musk suit is that if, if you're a right wing extremist tastemaker these days, you face the problem of how do you react to the more embarrassing public incidents involving some of your extremist fan base? And in the post-truth world, the easiest solution is just to deny that they're real. They're they're fabricated boogeyman by left wing interest or something like that. And it's the same formula here. You know, even in this case, Elon Musk was talking about psyops and the whole thing. And that's what makes this more damaging is that if you have people like Poole and Crowder telling their extremist audiences that this is fake, right, he's not a neo-Nazi, then if they see later legitimate news that, that shows the real identity of the shooter, they're not likely to believe it. Hey, so that, it becomes very difficult to remedy this problem. That in part, I, I, I want to read some uh, from the from the Poole thing in, which, in this filing, uh, but that part which you, which you just touched on, the idea that they are actively in the context of these obviously i i don't this isn't actionable in 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 uh, from you but i wonder how much does that aspect of it enhance their culpability or their liability within their case the idea that they are not only making a mistake the idea that they are also not issuing a retraction but then are actually building in a an excuse or an alibi for themselves in a more general standpoint in that like if you hear mm -hmm. that we're wrong 
understand that is part of a big operation that is supposed to smear us. So they're building in their alibi. Does that implicate your case in any way? Does it show intent or does it show, um, is it, is it more punitive? Are there more punitive damages of what, or, or is that just like a, what, what does that show in the context of your case? Really where it comes into play is the damages that the client suffers, right? Because if there's a defamation out there, then, then one of his ways to do that is either through self-help or through corrective media for people getting it right. And if you have an organization that's actively undermining those efforts, that is saying, don't believe what you see on these mainstream networks, we're the ones telling you the real truth, then when that truth gets out, it's less likely to hit people's, people's opinions. So the actual reputational damage to my client is somewhat hindered by what you're exactly talking about, this built-in ex escape hatch. That if they're wrong, when they're corrected, they can just say, well, that's the fake news. Don't worry about them. It makes the right? defamation that much more durable. And so exactly. it increases the damages that your client's mm -hmm. suffering because they can never recover in some ways because of other things that the, the these guys have done. That's That's fascinating. I mean, look, it's the same in the Sandy Hook case. To this day, no matter how much the volume of reporting that this really happened, there are still people who are absolutely stuck in drinking that Kool-Aid. Of thinking anything mainstream media tells them is wrong so it really poses a challenge for these kinds of people who've been hurt by this this stuck out for me in the tim pool uh um uh, because and we should just say when you, people are looking at this um at the uh original petition and you can get this online right this is available online that's um, a public document and uh uh we're you know and you have it for each one of the uh defendants here um this is paragraph 84 if people want to follow along at home and I'll, I'll just go ahead and say, if you need to grab a copy of the petition, uh, uh, Huffington Post has put one up. So Sebastian Murdoch did a story on it today. And there feel free is. to post this on uh, on social media, folks. I know uh, the folks, um, the defendants love the publicity. Mm. Uh, 84, Poole also claimed on Tipcast IRL that he did not want to so show the social media photos. Okay, so this is to be clear. Somebody, uh, the um, there was a... a a second sort of like release of photos of the actual um, uh, guy who perpetrated this, yes. not your client that, that was released subsequently on a different site. And this is where Tim pool decides to act responsibly. <laughs> this is what's fascinating about this. He's already shown the picture of your client. It's already out there. And then um, the actual picture surfaces and pool claims on Timcast that he did not want to show the social media photos, quote, considering the sensitive nature of these things. So he's already shown the false pictures. And then when the real pictures show up, he doesn't want to show them because it's sensitive and thus did not show any of the pictures, uh, of the photos of the real shooter. Poole also chided Bellingcat researcher Eric Toller, who published the real sh shooter's social media profile and photos, claiming that Toller didn't verify it now remember pool has already shown the unverified photos of the non-shooter but is now uh, attacking someone for showing and this is all all this does is makes it harder for your client to recapture his uh reputation all yes. of this just makes yeah. it like a steeper climb to get back to to hole or even close to it and yet at the time Poole made these comments, Timcast Media Group had already published a completely different, unverified and incorrect photo of the plaintiff on its website. Uh, and then, uh, in addition, Timcast news reporter Josie uh, Globach, known on Twitter as the Red-Headed Libertarian, posted several tweets declaring that the event was a psyop. Mm -hmm. And so that none of this happened. So they have now blamed it on the wrong person, and then said that none of it happened and that Eric Toller was a CIA operative. <laughs> does, does Toller, uh, like, uh, I, maybe Toller has an, op, uh, uh, an action. Each of the tweets garnered an uh, enthusiastic reply from Elon Musk. So this guy's just like, you bump into Elon Musk all the time now, as soon as you're doing yeah. your research. We, we got to keep meeting like this, yeah. In the following days, Musk repeatedly claimed the event was a psyop and the mainstream reporting on the shooter's identity was a lie. Um, and then uh, Poole continued to promote the idea the shooting was a government conspiracy. So that's all basically just like, 
you think you're going to get your reputation back in the future? Here's my alibi. And it's going to make it harder for you to get that reputation back. And then pool, according to this, um, quietly did take down the pictures, but never offered a retraction. And, and that correct. returns to my initial point of it being <laughs> that additional self-interest of that connection of the fact that the sh a real shooter had posted about Tim's show. Yes. Right. And, yes. Does, and when you go to, to court, does him pooling, uh, pulling down the photos, but then deploying this whole psyop uh, story simultaneously, does that show more intent? And is intent important to your case? Like, how much intent do you need to show in this instance? Or is intent not part of the, uh, the action? Yeah, it's really not part of the analysis here, to tell you the truth. Because what you're dealing with is a private person, right? And if you're going to make serious accusations of criminal conduct against a private person, you have to use reasonable care. If, yeah, if you have a higher you duty than you would if the person was well known, for instance. Exactly. If they were well known, if they were a public figure, right, then you would have to show an intent, an actual malice, a reckless disregard for the truth, which we think is obviously present here. But all you would have to show here is that they didn't act as a reasonably prudent media organization could. And, and you know that, that that's obviously true, because if you had followed what a reasonable media organization does, you would have never printed these photos. That would have never happened. And so in this case, it is interesting that in a lot of cases, when someone just deletes the article and then makes no acknowledgement of it and just tries to quietly get away from it, that looks bad. That looks really bad in a case. But if you do that and then also try to, to debunk and attack the mainstream corrections that are coming your way, boy, I don't think a jury's going to like that. I and, just don't think and, so. and does that intent, I mean, if you could show that intent to that level of sort of like backfilling and uh, attempting to protect... Is that become a more of an issue of damages and compensation and, and, and restitution than it does in terms of liability in the first place? So I just no, want people to understand you'd be there's, facing, there's liability well, challenge, and then damages, right? I mean, that's those exactly. Are the, okay. Exactly. And, and one of the things you'd normally be facing as a challenge is that if you wanted punitive damages in a case like this, you would have to prove some extreme reckless disregard, right? But in this case, because none of these defendants complied with the retraction statute and because they did not issue apologies. In this case, you can recover punitive damages without a showing of actual malice. So that's a so prima they, facie, essentially, uh, show that they're acting in that manner. And so, wow. Yeah. If Look, if these guys negligently did this, uh, this jury can award punitive damages if it thinks that's proper. And and I think certainly this is the kind of case that that screams for it. Do you, um, I mean, what, where are you in this case? I mean, I guess you just filed it. So the process goes at this point, a couple of defendants are going to come and go like, maybe we can make a deal. Uh, right. I mean, I, I would imagine hmm. like, I would who imagine who knows, I would imagine hmm. a lot People. of these guys are going to run and say like, uh, I'm willing to make a deal or at least their insurance companies are. Well, you got to understand some of these people might not be insured. Oh. And some of them may not have insurance cut policies that cover intentional defamation. Oh. Right? So you, you get some issues there. Who, and then who, who these, would issue a, an insurance policy for intentional defamation? Exactly. To them. Yes, exactly. And, and, and does Elon Musk responding to this and calling it a PSYOP just for the within this case amplify your client's, uh, 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 I guess, a case here because yeah, of his stature? Absolutely. So when when you have these right wing outlets who are kind of creating this buzz in the right wing media, which is not just Tim Pool, but also people like Crowder and Troyer and Simon Ataba, when these things start bubbling in that right wing ecosphere, that's where Elon Musk spends most of his time. And so when he starts promoting that to the world, these very messages that, that were generated by these defendants are getting to far more voices and far more ears than they would before. And so even though in this case, you don't have Elon Musk doing anything to my client, but because he was following along this narrative that was being born on Timcast, that this mm. was all a psyop, this really does hurt my client's ability to make himself whole again. Yeah. So theoretically, if Elon Musk were to have amplified a claim by someone like Tim Pool calling someone basically a pedophile, um, that and Elon Musk were to have responded to that, that would have, you know, also kind of fall under that standard as well. Absolutely. I can't imagine who we're talking about, but yeah, yeah that's. <laughs> would uh, um, uh, would let's just hypothetically say like one of us or either of us be considered public figures? I mean, if we're on uh, on YouTube, I yes. guess we are. 
But you would have to yes. know that what you were saying was um, not based in truth, right? You would or, have eh, you know, people people frame it that way that it requires like a knowledge of falsity, but what it really requires is just a reckless disregard for the truth. So, so if, if you're you had no therapy, evidence whatsoever for that claim. Whew. And you and, and and if you have a claim that's just inherently improbable, you know that it's probably dubious. You know you should look into it. Those those sorts of things make malice as well. So some people describe malice as the the kiss of death in defamation suits. That if you have a public figure, oh, you're never going to win. I just don't believe that's true. Um, and partially that's because the nature of defamation in the last ten years has gotten so much more malicious than it ever has been in our culture. Interesting. Well, maybe uh, maybe you should find a lawyer. Um, uh, but, uh, we can talk about that another time. Um, so, okay. So what, give us a sense of like the timeline here when, sure. um, like, uh, this was released two weeks ago. Um, and well, it was filed two weeks ago, filed Correct. two weeks ago. And so is this, and when it's filed are, I would imagine at that moment on that day, um, the defendants are notified. Is that right? Not, no, not actually not. So when they're filed, some of your more sophisticated defendants will pay docket monitoring services to know that they were sued, right? So Fox, for instance, is going to probably know on the day it was sued. But these other defendants have to wait until citation comes back and then service of process happens. And so it was this week that most of these defendants had a service processor, really? a processor Which show up day? at their doors. I mean, let's say I wanted to get a sense of like when, I mean, is it, is it public knowledge as to when these uh, people were serviced? Uh, it, it is now. I'm telling you right now it is. <laughs> and yes, that the, so, uh, the majority right. well, of them. Just out of curiosity, what day was it that, let's say, yeah, it was first day or this week was Tuesday through Thursday of this week. Tuesday through started. Thursday. Uh, mm -hmm. I, maybe we should go back and look at some shows and see how, uh, like, uh, what, uh, how sweaty people were. That would be very interesting to do. <laughs> um, but yeah, we, you know, we filed the suit a couple weeks ago. We've obviously, we, we sent letters to the offending parties within two weeks of this happening back in May of last year. We've been involved in long periods of negotiation and long periods of, of making sure everything's set and ready to go for the suit. Um, we filed the suit a couple weeks ago. We've accomplished service this week. We're announcing it today. When the defendants answer in 20 days from now, uh, they'll have about 60 days to move the dismiss the suit. And we'll go through the same process we're going through in the Musk suit. We'll probably have some discovery, depositions of these folks, uh, and then they'll try to dismiss the case. And then the court will say, go forward or not. Uh, and then we'll march forward into discovery and try to get a trial date. All right. So Bradley, get the calendar out. By the end of <laughs> April, they've mm -hmm. got to uh, respond. And then they have 60 days into file like a motion, uh, a, a summary motion to dismiss based Correct. upon whatever their theory is. And then right. you move into discovery and whatnot. Um, do you have any type of program or internship that I could apply for <laughs> so that I could be there for discovery? Uh, uh, well, uh, you know, um, most do of the world Do you need knows. an intern? <laughs> Luckily, I got enough of those at the moment. Um, you know, most of the world knows by now that I have very strong feelings about transparency and litigation and that I believe that more public attention to the court process and what's happening is good for the justice system. And therefore, anything that's a public record in my cases, um, I, I not only you know direct the media to where it's at, but I encourage them to report on it. And in this case, you better be sure that we're taking these depositions and doing this discovery. Uh, we will fight as hard as we can to make sure that the public interest is met and that these people can see what is happening in this case. You know, look, there may be some trade secrets or something like that. They get sealed up from here and there. Or then again, you may have it like a situation like Alex Jones and Elon Musk where the, the lawyers fail to get a protective order and it just all automatically becomes public. But I can tell you that one way or another, the information that's critical for the public to know to understand how this defamation happens, we're going to get that into the public eye. Um, so y'all should be looking forward to that in the next couple of months. All right, great. I'm still not giving up the uh, dream <laughs> of becoming an intern uh, for you, but we can talk about that maybe. Uh, Go ahead and we'll, you send me over a resume and we'll, we'll I talk will send you a resume. <laughs> um, one year of law school, you know. I went well, to one year of law school. I did, did my uh, civil pro uh, uh, cases. So, um, this is not an interview, Sam. <laughs> okay, all right. I just... Um, <laughs> 
Do you want to know where I see myself in five years? <laughs> right, exactly. Yeah. What, what would you say is your biggest weakness, Sam? Hey, well, I got a lot, but we don't have time for that now. Um, uh, so um, uh, we will keep our ears open. Uh, Mark Bankston, uh, partner at the law firm Farrar and Ball. Folks, Doing the Lord's work. We will put a link uh, to the Huffington Post publication of this, uh, of this petition. Uh, thanks so much for your time today. Thank you for your work. <laughs> yes. uh, really appreciate it. Always a pleasure to come talk to you. Thanks. Thanks, Mark.